But if we fail to decrease the threat at their sources, if we fail to persuade uh, or otherwise inhibit other nations from intruding or attacking us, um, then there's nothing we can do ultimately on the protection side. So we have to do both. We have to raise our defenses. We have to deter potential adversaries. So engaging internationally is about that. Uh, the president just a week and a half ago met with President Putin of Russia and announced a sequence of cybersecurity confidence building measures uh, as part of our efforts in that space. And the final priority is to shape the future. I think you guys know this, you live this every day, that ultimately for cybersecurity, we're in Vegas and we're playing against the house. It's easier to intrude or attack an, upon a network than it is to defend it right now. And so we have to, over the long term, shift those odds. That means research and development. Um, that means more tactically building a better workforce. Uh, it also means doing things like helping promulgate more secure protocols on the internet. The government's work, particularly DHS, S&T's work on DNS security are a key part of that. Uh, and that's one reason why you guys hear us harping about DNS security sometimes. So th those are the broader priorities of the cybersecurity coordinator. Secure government networks, protect critical infrastructure, improve incident response at the national level, engage internationally, and finally, shape the future. So how do you fit into that? Uh, depending on the role you play in your department, you may fit into all of those. But what I want to focus on right now is, is securing government networks. And I'm going to break that into two parts, national security systems and non-national security systems. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about why two years from now, if you have me back here, I hope I don't have to break it into two parts. So first, non-national security systems. This is the cross-agency priority goals. R raise your hand if you've heard of the cross-agency priority goals. This is good. Um, raise your hand if you hate coffee. OK, just testing to make sure you weren't just automatically raising there. <laughs> um, this is good. Uh, can anybody actually tell me what the three cross-agency priority goals are, just not what the actual targets are, but what the three, uh, three things we're trying to improve upon? You, you can shout it out if you got it. Oh, I, I see. Go ahead. PIV implementation. PIV, HSPD 12. All right, another. Any? Ticks. I heard ticks, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> DNS is not one of them, although we like it, so keep going on that. Continuous, Continuous monitoring, thank you. All right, see, I'm just trying to keep it lively here. It's, it's in the morning, you guys are, you know, you need, you need to work with me here. Um, so we have continuous monitoring, HSPD 12, and TIC. Um, and in reality, we have four metrics, four high-level metrics for those, because we break TIC into two. How much of your traffic are you routing through the TIC, and then what level of tick capabilities based on the tick 2.0 standard have you implemented? So we have these four metrics that we're tracking. We have targets for each of those metrics and then an overarching target. So why are we doing this? Like, well, you know, hopefully this is something that you understand intuitively. You want to make progress in your department uh, or your agency. Um, it's really easy. You just highlight all the things that are good and then people go off and do them and they get accomplished and no problems, right? That's how it works. That's my understanding. Um, we're not delusional at the White House. We know it's, it's simple. Uh, anybody? Come on. <laughs> All right. Got to work for him here. Uh, of, of course not, right? Life is hard. There are more priorities than you have resources and time. And so uh, one thing that we owe you is to make clear our priorities. And so that's what the cap goals are. Those are our priorities for federal agency cybersecurity uh, in the non-national security space sorry, non-national security systems space. Uh, what are we trying, well, first of all, let me tell you about the cap goal as an overarching construct. It's a big deal that cybersecurity is a cap goal. There are 14 of them overall. Very few of them look like the cybersecurity goal. Um, another goal is to um, double our exports as a nation in a certain time frame. There are goals about dramatically decreasing our usage of uh, fossil fuels, things like that. So these are very big goals. Uh, and to have the cybersecurity goal as one of them is a level of the importance that the administration is placing on the cybersecurity of federal networks. Because the rest of these goals, again, many of them are national goals. This is a goal solely for federal government agencies. So that's a big deal. Why, but why are we using that vehicle at all? Why don't we just tell you what our priorities are? And there's two reasons for that. 
One of them is, is we know that your job is tough. And one way that your job is tough is that you don't always get the support or the attention from your leadership that I certainly think you deserve. Um, and I think the folks in this room think you deserve. So the goal, the, the purpose of using the CAP goals is to in fact bring other people into this conversation. I don't know, at a given agency, the performance improvement officer, the person responsible for the CAP goals, may be in a lot of different places. They may be an assistant secretary for management, they may be the CFO, they may be in the deputy secretary's office, but generally, they're, they're inevitably outside of the CIO's office, but in a place within the organization where it's actually very helpful uh, to have them engaged helping the CIO accomplish your mission. That's certainly what we've been hearing. If you feel differently, grab me afterwards and let me know, because I'm always looking for feedback on that. So one of our purposes here is to bring somebody else into the conversation who can help you with resources, who can help you elevate the priority of these things within your department and agency. The other reason for using the CAP goals is to be, to be transparent about this, to, to post our results, our targets, and our quarterly results on performance.gov. Um, and we think this helps everybody at Elf. It helps you within your agencies make clear what your priorities are and how you're doing against them, and it helps us uh, hold you accountable, and it helps the public hold us accountable. So we're bringing in performance improvement officers, and we're engaging them on this. We have public scorecards on performance.gov, and the most recent set of scorecards went up uh, May 31st, June 1st, right around there. The final two aspects of this are the President's Management Council and Cyberstats. Uh, I won't ask you to raise your hand if you've been in a Cyberstat, although I think it's an honor. <laughs> Why did that one get a laugh? I don't understand. Uh, but we hold Cyberstats where we ask the CIO, the CISO, and their key staff to come in, but also the agency's performance improvement officer. Uh, Often we bring in somebody from, say, the Assistant Secretary or Undersecretary for Management, um, and then we bring in the OMB uh, budget officers responsible for that agency. And the goal here is to have a conversation, one, about how we can help you as an agency improve on your CAP goals, but also for us to help, under, help us understand what are the problems you're facing, so that when we see if three or four different agencies are facing those same problems, then that's something we probably need to tackle at an interagency level. Um, we have found these to be very helpful. I hope that those of you who have gone through them have found them to be helpful as well. But that's also not enough. That's a, a tool in our arsenal, but not enough. The thing we are, single thing we are most focused on through the use of these CAP goals is to get your deputy secretary involved in this. Ultimately, we want deputy secretaries to understand that the IT and the security of their agency's IT systems is a priority that should matter at their level and should be on their daily radar. Now, some of you are from agencies where your deputy secretaries are completely engaged. Some of you wish your deputy secretaries were slightly less completely engaged. Uh, but many of you are from agencies where your deputy secretary has not previously paid any attention to your issues. Uh, and from our perspective, that's a problem. So the final thing we're doing in, as part of these CAP goals is we're holding President's Management Council sessions on cybersecurity. So President's Management Council is a, essentially a deputy secretary level meeting hosted by the uh, deputy of OMB for management. Steve Van Rokel is the new acting deputy uh, of OMB for management, and so uh, I sort of suspect that we'll continue to hold these PMC meetings on CIO level issues. Uh, we've had two meetings so far on the CAP goals, uh, and from our perspective, this has done a really good job of helping deputy secretaries see the importance of these goals. Uh, and we've gotten a lot of feedback, a lot of questions from deputy secretaries. We also see deputy secretaries a lot through our National Security Council meetings. Uh, and whether we're having a meeting on uh, a completely different topic, maybe an internationally related cybersecurity topic, we often get a question from the deputy secretaries uh, on the outskirts of those meetings about the CAP goals. So from our perspective, that means we're doing well. Let me move quickly to the uh, national security system side and let you know our five priorities there. Again, hopefully you know these. Uh, one is removable media control. Uh, the second is to improve, uh, essentially reduce anonymity on national security systems. The third is access control. The fourth is audit. And the fifth is national insider threat 
policy and its implementation. Um, I think it's safe to say that we're not all the way there on securing our classified networks uh, from adversaries and insider threats. Uh, I won't belabor that point, uh, but we have made enormous progress over the last two years. Uh, similar set of processes as the CAP goals. We have the steering committee, uh, a White House level group co-chaired by OMB and the National Security Council uh, to hold agencies accountable for meeting these goals. Uh, we have report cards. You guys know all about this. Uh, from our perspective, both of these sets of initiatives are going well. And that's one reason why I wanted to talk to you, is because if you feel differently, I want to hear that from you. Same as Adam. Uh, feedback is crucially important to us. So grab me afterwards, send me an email, um, let me know if you feel differently. But also if you feel like they're going well, I'd love to hear that too. Brighten my morning. Uh, when we look to the future, these two initiatives will achieve, if we're successful, a significant level of implementation by the end of FY14, uh, or in some cases into FY15, uh, for the National Security Systems goal. So that raises the question of what are we setting as our priorities past that point? We're going to drive these priorities until they're complete. So we're not, we're not going to give them up. If we, don't, if we reach the end of FY14 and we're not there, then we're going to keep pushing. But if we have made the progress that we expect to make, then we will be able to turn our attention to another set of priorities. And so the final point I want to make is from our perspective, moving forward, we actually have to integrate these priorities. And we have to have a single set of priorities for national security systems and non-national security systems, just as we have been, over time, integrating our approach to security on both national and non-national security systems. Now, they won't always be exactly the same, but the way we're viewing this is non-national system security is a baseline that national security systems also have to meet. Now, national security systems may then have some additional pillars on top of that where they need to make extra progress or do particular things. Uh, but we're not confident right now that national security systems have actually achieved the baseline that we're expecting from non-national security systems. And so we need to integrate our management of those um, and look at them from a more holistic perspective. I think the single biggest success we've had to date in that, well, we've had two, two major successes. The first is the integration of DIACAP and, and the NIST uh, standards. And then the second is the Joint Continuous Monitoring Working Group happening right now under the auspices of the CIO Council and the CNSS. So we view both of those as enormous successes, an indicator of where we need to go in the future. So the, the one thing I'm, I'm going to leave you with is as you go about your day today and in the future, start thinking, what would you put as your priorities for FY15 and 16 if we continue this construct, which it's our intention to do, of setting a clear set, a small priority, a small a number of priorities for 15 and 16, and we've accomplished those that we've set out right now, what should those next set of priorities be? Again, ideally, the same across national security systems and non-national security systems. It's fine if one or two extra ones are on the national security system side. So that's, that's my sort of charge for you moving forward, is, is help us understand what you think the best set of priorities in that space will be. And we will, of course, be coming back to you uh, more formally through the CIO Council, through the Steering Committee to have this conversation. But I want to plant the seed now, because this conversation we need to have now so that we can be successful uh, and really successfully set up those goals uh, in advance of FY15 and 16. With that, let me open for questions. You guys are really busy writing tweets, right? <laughs> I know it. Good morning. How are you doing, Andy? Good morning. Um, just a real quick, this is um, Thorne Graham from the um, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. At least that's, that's where they currently are putting up with me. Um, let me just ask a quick question regarding WikiLeaks and what national security staff did and, you know, keep it FOUO. It seems to me, though, that um, all the talk about HSPD-12, we haven't integrated that with, um, I want to say, the minimum requirements for people to be able to have access only to that information they need to do their job. So I don't know if you're hearing me, but I think there's two initiatives we need to do, 
and, and one is, is to reduce the amount of information that people have access to that they do not need to get their job done. And then secondarily is to use um, uh, HSPD-12 or some type of asymmetrical encryption such that, um, uh, for example, this new guy, right, uh, Snowden, um, if we were using some type of symmetrical encryption, his access could have been refuted, and then if the, if the data itself um, had DRM qualities, he would have been able to commit no harm. So something to think about. So the question was, do I like coffee? Uh, for those who couldn't hear, I love coffee. Um, big fan. Now, uh, you, know, the, you know, largely, I'll, I'll say, you know, a few things. First, I think the set of priorities we put in place in the post WikiLeaks uh, situation were a pretty good set of priorities. Uh, unusually tactical in response to a situation like that, but the consensus at the time, and I think it has proven to be true, is we really needed to actually focus on those tactical things and drive them to completion. They were key building blocks or key immediate security measures we need to take. But I think we're still living in a world uh, where, one, we have to balance the, trade, the, the need for securing things with the need to access them. And that's why the steering committee is the steering committee for safeguarding and sharing information. What we didn't want to do after the WikiLeaks situation was revert to the pre-September uh, 11th world where people felt like they weren't always able to access the information that they did need to do their jobs. On the other hand, we'd like to deny people access to information that they don't need to do their jobs. Uh, and I don't know that we're fully there yet. Uh, so we can't overact and we can't end up, in fact, decreasing the information available to folks. Um, but we do new, need to do a better job of controlling the information we have. And, and often, you know, the approach to do that is through audit. When you don't know what information people need to have access to, then watch what they access um, and then respond if they seem to be accessing uh, unusual or inappropriate amounts or types of information. But I think a, a bigger lesson to take away from this is while we absolutely do need to focus on security controls and the technology to secure ourselves, and we have a lot of progress to make on that, uh, there's also a human equation here that we're, we're never going to get rid of. So we're, we're never going to be able to eliminate insider threats, um, but we can really focus on not just the technology side of it, but the personnel side and the other indicators of insider threats that are not technically focused. Um, and that's the reason, of course, for the insider threat policy uh, in an area where we also need to make big progress. I think we had another question up here. Hi, I'm from USAID. Um, I have a question. Uh, did the council consider different priorities for smaller agencies who have international presence? So, for example, <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is, you know, to get a PIV card to somebody in, in, in the remote parts of Africa um, is very tough. Um, has, have you considered giving uh, priorities for uh, USAID, Peace Corps, Millennium Challenge Corporation, something that's workable for us? So I, I do appreciate that you threw in a few other agencies because that sounded like an awfully customized question. <laughs> um, on any, any priority like this, um, there's a tough balance to strike. And, and the balance is by uh, you know, everybody feels like they have unique and special problems uh, on implementing anything. Um, and there's a degree to which that's true and there's a degree to which that's not true. I mean, you guys know this, you face this within your own agencies. Um, and we have to strike the balance between holding a firm line and saying, look, this is a priority and that means even when it's hard, we're going to do it, and not being insane and saying, look, this is a priority, but it's completely inappropriate and applicable in this situation. Um, Obviously, that's not acceptable either, and so we have to strike the balance. Um, in situations that are that are unique like that, we're we're happy to talk with folks about, and we do have those conversations with folks about. Um, we are also seeing a lot of innovative solutions in the PIV space. Uh, you know, you you may have extreme scenarios, but the Department of Interior has has widely distributed personnel, people who are on uh, you know fire watch towers in the middle of, of rural areas who only access systems periodically and, and maybe not for security related initiatives. You know, you, you, can, you can come up with a whole lot of uh, similar scenarios. And, and right now, uh, I think GSA is doing a great job of coming up with solutions in terms of, of letting people more easily, remotely um, get PIVs issued to them or PIV cards issued to them and reset and et cetera. Um, and so there are solutions there, but we also need to look at the policy on, on a case by case basis when you have a real, uh, you know, overriding 
reason that it's, it's just not applicable in your situation. So we're happy to talk about those. Good morning, Charles McClam from USDA. Um, since cybersecurity is a strategic cap goal, do you see any, um, any fallout or any um, uh, 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 recommendations coming in the 2015 budget that would put more emphasis on cybersecurity and, and how we leverage that to manage our respective enterprises? Half the people in this room love you for asking that question and half the people in this room hate you. Uh, <laughs> And the difference might be whether they have an S in their title. Uh, so yes and no. So for the 14 budget process, uh, OMB issued a memorandum about IT that essentially said, uh, and you guys know this better than I, but you, you need to make a, a cut of a per certain percentage, but you need to redirect that cut into certain priorities. The cap goals in cybersecurity were one of the priorities that were suggested that you could reallocate those cut funds. Um, with individual budget examiners, we've also worked with respect to given agencies and, and really the examiners now really understand the cap goals much better than they did. And in 14, uh, not probably for every agency, for, but for many agencies we saw, the examiners really prioritize the cap goals and push back on agencies if they felt like they were receiving inadequate prioritization. Um, for 15, we're gonna do the same, and that's a continuing process of one, both the overarching policies that come out, and then two, the education of the individual examiners. If, if you think in your agency that's not getting the attention, uh, very happy to talk about that afterwards. Um, but, you know, again, w we want to walk the fine line here of, of encouraging and helping you to fund these cap goals, uh, but also realizing that, you know, you all have different environments and you need the ability to use your discretion. Hey, Andy, Larry Denaire and uh, DHS USCIS. I'm just wondering, if, uh, curious about your opinions of where the low-hanging fruit for insider threat programs for non-national uh, non security systems might, might play, where you see the value there and maybe some strategies? Um, you know, I, I don't really have an answer to that question. I think it's a great one. Uh, so I would love to hear your answers. I think intuitively, uh, my immediate thoughts on low-hanging fruit is I think it's Carnegie Mellon that has the insider threat program. Uh, and if I recall correctly, that they've identified the sort of areas of biggest, uh, the most useful indicators for the detection of insider threat are HR indicators. Um, and so it seems to me that, that a very easy, or no, this is not easy, but a very good first step is to, is to be able to um, access those HR indicators, or even better, have those HR indicators pushed to you when, when flags occur, and then tie that into, for example, um, are you getting flags on a system administrator? That may be a hindsight set of wisdom right there, but uh, that would seem like a good first step. Focus on, on the HR indicators and then the most important personnel, those, those people with elevated level of privilege. Andy, I'll ask you one last question unless anyone else wants to jump in before I do. So you talked about cyber stats and you talked about the performance improvement officer. Uh, something I hear a lot is that CIOs are responsible for cap goals, but they are not the person that actually has the power to do anything about it because the PIO is not available or not engaged or they're not at the table in meetings. What sort of things are you all thinking about about ways to mitigate those types of problems, um, particularly for things like cyber stats? If you're not there, it's hard to have an influence. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a... Uh, a sort of, there's two edges to the, uh, the, the, challenge, the, the goal of getting the PIO involved, right? The, the benefit is we bring somebody on board and, and get them engaged in the success of an initiative where they can contribute from outside. They can maybe um, influence through the CFO's office budget or raise the visibility of this with the, the department leadership. Um, the downside, of course, is, is you introduce more people into something that, um, and, and maybe muddy the accountability waters or responsibility waters a little bit. Um, what we're focusing on that is one, getting the PIOs at the cyber stats, um, and I, I can think of one recently where we failed on that due to last minute cancellation, I think, but other than that, we've, we've succeeded. Um, and two, really bringing this to the PIO council, um, and we have, have and continue to do so, but really raising the visibility of this to the PIO council and, and emphasizing to them that their responsibility is to help make sure that you, the CIOs, have what you need to be successful in this program. 
Any other questions? All right, well, thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Okay, right on time. It's not like me, but we're doing great so far. Uh, Craig mentioned to me after I was up here that I forgot the answer to the question about how are we gonna communicate these sorts of things to you all, one important part of the council strategy, um, which is pretty significant. Um, and that's the use of the max.gov site. Um, we are, uh, we've kind of done some templates. We're having some information sharing modules. Um, there is information on all the groups within the council on what the priorities are gonna be, on when meetings happen, on who you need to ask for questions, is all on max.gov. Um, so I'm, I, one of the questions I wanted to ask to try to mirror stuff Andy did, how many people have a max ID? All right, that's good. Okay, so you'll have access. Um, just search for CIO Council, it'll pop right up. Um, if you have problems accessing pages, let us know, we'll work with you. Um, but I wanna make sure I, I mention that because um, we're gonna continue, we've been using it a lot more over the last six months and we're gonna continue to use it a lot more. Great, okay, so now we're going to move to the, into the case studies. Um, there's two, they're in rooms 1107, that's, uh, this is on your agenda, that's for approaching HSPD 12 and mobile. And then room 1119 is combating cyber intrusions. Um, there's folks outside in the lobby to direct you, but um, you walk past the registration desk, turn left, and then those rooms are on your right-hand side. You have to kind of go back into a, a, a separate hallway, um, but it's pretty easy to find. Um, and those will be for an hour. We'll have a break for 15 minutes at 11, and then Steve will be here at 11.15. The expo in Marshall Hall uh, is open. Um, uh, go down uh, if you want to check that out. We encourage you to kind of interact with folks there. Um, uh, at their, uh, if you have problems finding anyone down there, just let us know and we'll direct you in the right way. Thanks.